Hey everyone, it's Lumen. We've got a new video series. As most of you know, most of my content revolves around four-player Agricola with card expansions, but not Farmers of the Moor. This video series is going to be like a tour of sorts through the other varieties and variants of playing Agricola. As you can see, this video series is sponsored. Uh, so thank you very much to Ted for sponsoring this video series. If you enjoy these videos, you should thank Ted in the comments below, or possibly if you see him on BGA or Twitch, you can thank him at uh, his screen names there. Uh, it's exciting for me to be able to actually say that I've created a sponsored Agricola video series. It's crazy. Uh, so part one of this series is going to be looking at what other player counts look like strategically. Uh, we're going to try to look at all the player accounts with kind of four player as a relative control of sorts. Um, and as I've said, a majority of my games are four player, but I do consider myself pretty good at the other player accounts as well. Um, and I'm not going to focus too much on how these player accounts are different between original and revised editions of the game. We'll break down more of the original versus revised stuff in uh, part two. So without further ado, let's get into the solo mode, Agricola. So in solo, you're obviously trying to optimize your score. However, the mechanics of accumulation spaces means that your sequences of moves versus the rounds that have flipped and the rounds that haven't flipped make the strategy very different. Overall, you're going to be most of the time going for a three-room game or a four-room game. And the things you really need to look for when deciding whether to go for a three-room game with really good farming or a four-room game also with very good farming are, are these resources. So number one, food. In a solo game, your family members don't eat two food at the harvest, they eat three each. And if you want to support a big family, that obviously means you need to come up with a huge food engine. So to set up your big food engine, you don't want to be fishing or taking sheep in stage one. And you don't have too much stuff to get done in stage one most of the time. And my recommended path to score consistently well in solo games is take day laborer all four rounds of stage one. Save your sheep pile, save your fishing pile for rounds seven and nine. That's when you'll want them to be worth like six to 10 food, very roughly. Along with having the sheep pile, the fishing, you're also probably going to need to bake at least a little bit. And that means having grain in the ground hopefully early enough, or it'll be a rare category that you're sacrificing, not getting too many points in. Overall, you really want to maximize your farm. You want to hypothetically score six or seven points as if you had Lord of the Manor. You want to maximize almost every category. So if there's not enough wood to build a fourth room, don't. Make sure you get really good fences, put a couple stables in those pastures, hold almost as many animals as you can possibly score. Uh, that's really gonna be how you maximize your score for the most part. If there's not any stone in your hand, you're also going to have a hard time hitting your point ceiling of renovating to a stone house and buying as many major improvements as you can. Through most of the mid game and end game in a solo game, you want to be buying one major improvement around on average, whether that's on renovation or the major improvement space. So food, wood, stone. Those are what you want to look for in your opening hand most of the time. And as I said, day labor early, save your sheep and fishing for mid game, decide how many rooms you want based on your resources and really max out your farm. So examples I have here of good solo game cards. We have the seasonal worker, which I think is a really solid one because it's giving you grain while you're taking those almost mandatory day labor actions in stage one. And then some uh, really busted cards that are not well balanced for solo. Um, these are the ones you can really score super high with. 
Uh, Master Bricklayer says you can ignore all the stone you want when you build major improvements if you've got two or three rooms effectively. Um, so hypothetically on a four room house, you might only need six stone the entire game. One extra for the well, one extra for the stone oven, and four for your renovation to stone. Then Tree Guard gives you like a bit of almost everything. And the downside that Tree Guard has when playing with other players that you have to leave wood on the, the wood action spaces, uh, you're just leaving that for yourself later. So there's no long-term problem with Tree Guard. In my experience playing Tree Guard games, which are super fun, by the way, you can often build two wood rooms and then two stone rooms if you have any decent discounting. It's kind of crazy how much stuff you can get by tree guarding 10 times in a game or something like that. And I believe the current record for a solo game, I don't remember what the points are, but it involves a big tree guard combo where you're baking and activating baking cards. So if you really want to maximize, go for a really high scoring solo game way over 100. Your best bet in revise is going to be tree guard. Um, in a similar vein, you can try to maximize solo score in what's called a solo series. This is a game variant where you play a solo game, and at the end of the game you get to keep an occupation that you played to start your next game with in play, basically in round, played in round zero for free. And each game you finish above the target scores, you can find that in the rulebook, uh, you get to after each game you finish, you get to add an auk to your team up to seven. And then for the next game, you just start with one less auk in hand. Um, this mode is available on the original edition app, which is not for sale anymore. So if you're one of the lucky ones who owns that app, you can play the solo series there uh, in a digital form. Otherwise, you're more or less restricted to improvising on play Agricola or playing live but solo series is a really great challenge, as well as playing the same hand over and over, trying to maximize it, trying to say, for example, squeeze a 68th point when you've been able to score 66, 67 with the hand and uh, keeping the same round order. So that's the solo game. Uh, I very much enjoy it as a different type of Agricola puzzle. Hopefully you do too. Now moving on to two player. Two player, I consider Agricola at its most evil. So many people think that Agricola is a pretty harsh game, and it kind of gets worse at two-player if you're playing competitively. Relative to four-player Agricola, I find that clay and food are very tight, and in many games one player will try to completely block off room parts from the other player, whether that's the reed they need or the wood they need. So there's a lot of tactical fight options that you can choose to try in a two-player game. Both people should, or both players should get to four people by the mid or the end game. In my experience in two-player Agricola, usually the accumulation spaces on the board just get really good by the late mid game and in the end game. Breeding pairs are extremely common, three stone, four stone, and you just want to have enough actions to take advantage of a super good board, and that usually happens with both people at four actions. Um, this is best done if there's enough wood in the game for you to build two wood rooms early, but many games you'll want to either pivot to a clay room, have some family growth help in the original edition, um, or something similar to that, so you're not losing out on extremely good boards. Um, in two-player Agricola, it's very crucial to be acting tactically and trying to set up the right number of actions that are good on the board for the next round. If you know you're going to be start player, you really want to try for there to be one or three premium actions on the board in the next round, and likewise if your opponent takes start player, you'll really want to make that number of premium actions two or four, an even number, so that you're getting just as many as they are. The first growth in a two-player game doesn't need to be super contested because most of the time it's only a one-action advantage, 
but that one action advantage for one of the mid-game rounds can be very strong tactically. So you do need to consider your moves around two or even three ahead of the time in the family growth queue, hoping to not let your opponent, if they're growing first, to get a big tactical advantage from that. And uh, I, I said that I don't want to go too deep into revised versus original here, but in my limited revised two-player experience, it does seem looser than playing two-player in the original edition. And um, that might be something you like, might be something you don't like. I think personally, I prefer original, though again, for two-player, I don't have a ton of experience with revised. Um, the examples I have here, well, we have two cards that provide clay and one card that is kind of combative in the fishing net. Um, I would be drafting Clay Puncher and Clay Supply super highly. Um, one thing about two-player is that the first round, at least in the original edition, was pretty scripted. You'd have starting player take the only occupation space, second player would take three wood, first player would take day labor around one second action because food you don't want to lose out tactically and there's a fishing pile but there's no traveling players pile so day labor is a fine action at uh, second action round one for the starting player in original two player and then start player after taking three wood for player two and then in round two and this goes for both editions there's frequently four good spaces three wood occupation two read and two clay. Two clay can be a super premium action in two player. Not only can you starve room parts, like trying to block out read, like prevent your opponent from getting read at all, then they can't build rooms, you know, that can be pretty good. But if you clay starve someone and they don't have food outs, there is humongous leverage on the pile of fishing and you can just win the game very early on if you can clay starve your opponent and also take fishing. You have to like have an opponent who's taking risks in order for that to happen, but it is a way to win very quickly in two player. Um, that about sums up the main points I wanted to get to in two, in two player, so I'll go to three player now. In three-player Agricola, especially in original, reed and food are the tight spots. Sometimes clay can be tight, but there are two accumulation spaces for clay, both accumulating one around, so it is a better ratio than in two-player. So the stats for three-player on Play Agricola for the original edition showed strongly that if you draft help for reed or fishing, those cards perform extremely well in three player relative to four player. And of course here we have the mushroom collector, which is also really good in three player. I can't necessarily explain that one. And admittedly, it is a bit of a meme in my Twitch channel about uh, how mushroom collector is not a feeding engine. There's something about the three player wood stacks, I think is what it is that really makes mushroom collector shine in that count uh, along with some food tightness because there's still no traveling player's accumulation space in three player. And I think that's another reason why fishing help is really good. So mushroom collector, canoe, these are two really classically great three player cards that you want to look for. Something like brushwood collector would also be great. Um, very similar to two player, when you get to the mid game or the end of the game, the action spaces on the board are going to be pretty good, even on your third or fourth action. And for that reason, you really want to try to get to four players by the middle or the end of the game. The family growth queue is looser than it is in four player. And as such, you should be able to navigate your way through that. There's enough growth spaces for people to get to four player before the, uh, to four actions before the end game almost every time. So, don't miss out on those good action spaces just like two player. Make sure you get a big enough family to to do well on the board. The there is one interesting quirk about three player in terms of seating order. 
And that's the third player has a pretty noticeable disadvantage if you look at a large sample of stats. And that's kind of because the best three actions to start off a three player game, well, there aren't three best actions. There's still two good actions. It's Cheapok and three wood. Now, Revised did make a change to the take one resource space from original and uh, it turned it into read or stone plus food. I think that's an okay first action as third seat. Two wood is the other consideration. Neither of them seem great. Um, and I think in original three player, the third player disadvantage is even stronger in a, in a bad way. Um, so that is a bit of a quirk about three player. All right, so I'm not gonna go over four player too long because that is the majority of the content that I talk about, and we are using it as a kind of control group here. Uh, but the main strategic thing about four player is that it is the single player count where, in my opinion, the largest variety of strategies are viable. And when I say that, I'm mostly referring to how big your family is and when you're doing your farming versus when you're doing your growing, if you're growing much at all, uh, it's really about the four players jockeying for one family growth action space in the mid game, which gives some breathing room for other strategies to blossom if you have enough card support. Um, furthermore, the action spaces on the board are typically not too good by the time your third or fourth action rolls around. So the marginal benefit to those third and fourth actions is smaller than three player and especially two player. So those factors combined um, and in my opinion, are what makes four player uh, the best format competitively. There seems to be pretty widespread agreement worldwide on four player being the best competitive player count. Uh, that might sound very biased from my perspective, but if you try to find the top Agricola players worldwide, I'm pretty confident you'll find that almost all of them play four player. Uh, examples of four player cards, we have Childless, which is amazing in four player and kind of bad in most other player accounts. You can try it out and maybe there's a couple good games for it, but usually not. And Scholar, which is a card that gives you extra actions, um, faux actions if you will, is something else that really does best in four player. You can play it in other player accounts, but relative benefit is really strong with Scholar in a four player. All right, and now five player. So five player Agricola, the thing that gets really tight are the major improvements. And I haven't mentioned the major improvements except for the solo game. And you want to think about how you're feeding as soon as possible when you start up a five player game, get your cards, do your draft, however you do it, know how you're feeding right after you know your hand. Because if you need a fireplace or a cooking hearth, four other players are at this table and there are only four fireplaces and cooking hearths combined. If you need one, you cannot afford to lose out. So take care of your feeding implement as quickly as you can. Likewise, if you see a lot of grain in a draft, for example, and you're trying to bake, well, you can expect the oven to, the clay oven to get taken pretty quickly. And you know, the stone oven's not cheap early on in the game. So you really just want to make sure in a five player game that you have your feeding taken care of pretty early on. Um, plows are another thing that get pretty tight in five player, depending on the draft, of course because there's still only the one plow space. And, you know, as you get more and more players at the table, there's still only one plow space. So it's something that really tightens up as you get more players in the game up to five. So be wary of that. Sometimes wood is tight in five player games too. And the ratio of wood on the board every round versus four player there is more wood in five player, but in my experience, people spend wood more aggressively in five player. And part of that is because five player, like two player, like three player, 
is a player account where I find you really want to have four actions. And for the other player accounts, the reasoning is that the board is quite good by the fourth action and the marginal benefit for the fourth action can be pretty good. In a five player game, it's actually different and the stuff on the board, the actions on the board get pretty dry pretty quickly. Uh, there are plenty of five player games I've played where I'm excited to get one cow second action. And uh, yeah, the board can get pretty rough. If you don't have three or four actions to sum up a good set of actions, you usually don't have enough stuff to do well in the game. It's not a matter of efficiency sometimes in a five-player game. It can really be a grind sometimes. Um, to that end, examples of good five-player cards are cards that turn a bad action space into a decent or better action space for you only. Um, some people call this making a button. If I refer to a button later on in this video or a series, I'm talking about making a bad action good for you with the help of cards. So making a button is a really great idea in five player. You want to get to four people before the end game to make sure that you can clean up the dregs of the board as well as everyone else does. Uh, and the other thing about five player games is that this is where a second family growth space gets added, which really lets all the family growth happen. Um, so the family growth queue is a bit looser. Uh, there is a bit of a tactical difference in the growth queue as you can block a family growth action space by playing expensive Ock because it's like a split action for those of you who are unfamiliar. Similarly, there is a second build rooms action, but it's tied up with traveling players. So you can be tactical in, if you want to try to block out people's ability to build and grow early on in a five player game and it doesn't involve you necessarily building or growing yourself. So there are interesting tactics there. You probably don't want to risk it too much. You just want to be safe, do your builds, do your grows, and attack that board. A couple premium actions that uh, you really want to, well, you really don't want to pass up too much in a five player game are four wood and six clay. Those are pretty premium, especially the clay if you haven't solved your feeding yet. Uh, don't delay taking it, because it's going to be taken by someone. Uh, the clay stacks up three at a time, so you'll see six clay plenty during the game. Um, for revised edition, there is a set of occupations that are five plus only, and as a general rule of thumb, those occupations are good in five player formats. Some of them sound pretty bad and terrible, those usually are bad and terrible, but the ones that don't sound bad and terrible are usually pretty good, so watch out for that. Alright, and then the last player count that I don't have card examples for is the six player game. The six player game is new to the revised edition. Um, it comes with t uh, eight more majors, not ten, and has even more action spaces. Uh, so. I've played six-player Agricola maybe three times. I don't have the most experience in it. What I've noticed in those brief games is that the family growth queue is possibly tight enough for some strategies that only work at four-player. You might want to give those a try in six-player. There are two family growth spots for the six players at the table. So given that those family growth spots are contested for however many rounds they are in the middle of the game, the queue for family growth might look a lot more like a four player than a five player. Um, the other thing to note for six player, because you're only gonna be playing it live there, or maybe you have a tabletop simulator implementation, um, it is a burden if you are the one who usually controls the stocking of the board and tracking to help make sure everyone's doing their moves legally. I'm usually that person in my play groups and in the six player games I've played, it's a struggle sometimes. And by the end of the game, even if I'm doing great or not doing great, I'm just glad to be done with like the logistics part of a six player game. It's not necessarily my favorite format for Agricola. So six players is where this video is going to end as there are no official ways to play with more than six players or less than one. Uh, 
yeah, I, I don't know any of those. Uh, I hope this video was informational and entertaining. Uh, thanks very much for watching. Part two coming soon. Thanks.